evening. I'm Rosemary Barton, and this is The National. As a BC wildfire burns out of control, conditions are ripe for a blazing midsummer. People court danger for the sake of an epic selfie. And they're like, no, don't go that far, just sit right over here. And I was like, no, you gotta sit right at the end. It's led to rescues and a recent death. A wildly unpopular governor reaches for a new low. It's a holiday weekend. What about all the kids that had birthday parties? Why it's no day at the beach for Chris Christie. And as Justin Trudeau takes off to meet world leaders, we ask if Canada and the U.S. are growing apart. Tinder dry conditions, thick smoke, and steep, hard-to-reach terrain. That's what fire crews are up against in British Columbia tonight. They're on the ground and in the sky, trying to bring a fast-moving wildfire under control. And as the CBC's Leanne Young tells us, with more hot weather on the way, there are concerns about the fire season ahead. Helicopters weave in and out of plumes of smoke as a wildfire burns out of control near British Columbia's Harrison Lake. 60 hectares of green mountainside charred. Around the coast, 10 fires were started this weekend. We have found that most of the fires uh, to date have been carelessness. The fire sparked on Saturday afternoon and grew quickly to 20 hectares. Overnight, it tripled in size to 60 hectares. In the last 24 hours, crews have been able to stop the spread, but the fire is still considered uncontained. This area just off Harrison Lake is very remote. The closest town is 30 kilometers away. It's windy, but the only advantage is that firefighters have a large body of water to work from. Yesterday, more than 600 campers at a nearby provincial campsite were forced to leave. Officials said the long lines of cars congested the main service road used by fire crews. And now we've just been informed that we are on evacuation, so... I'm assuming maybe winds have changed and everybody's getting evacuated at the moment. Campers like Kat Jossie's family of nine forced to cut their long weekend plans short. Disappointed. We came here from Vernon, BC, so <laughs> we don't got anywhere else to go right now. Officials worry this is just a sign of what's to come. Just yesterday, another fire, this one in Whistler. Crews worked to contain it but say it was also human caused. Around the coastal region, the fire danger rating is still at moderate, meaning there is an increased risk of fire. Just beyond that area, that risk jumps from high to extreme. With no end in sight to the hot, dry weather, officials are pleading with those who love the outdoors to be cautious. Leanne Young, CBC News, Harrison Lake. For some, getting that perfect selfie has become an obsession. Whatever the motivation, immortalizing a holiday moment, scoring social media likes, or just proving you were there, it seems that no risk is too great to snap that perfect pic. And as Stephanie Skanderas reports, that's quickly becoming a serious and even deadly problem. It's not hard to spot them. Daredevils trying to get a closer look or a perfect shot, no matter the risk. Like here at Albion Falls, one of more than 100 waterfalls in Hamilton. And I was like, no, you got to sit right at the end. <laughs> got to dangle these feet. <laughs> so, yeah, give my new kick some memories. There's a waterfall down there. We've seen pictures. It's really cool. So we just kind of take the risk. Signs and gates can't hold them back. City official Kara Bunn says she has seen it all. I've seen people in wedding dresses, I've seen people with little babies, um, people with their children, uh, all different situations which could be potentially dangerous. And keeping people out is a losing battle. Yes. And when you put up signs and fencing like this, how long does it last? Not very long, a couple hours. As the waterfall's popularity increases, so too does the risk of serious injury, even death. 25 people had to be rope rescued in 2016, the largest number in at least seven years. Last month, five people were rescued and one person died. The city is now putting in fencing and more forcefully worded signs. This is one of the new barriers the city has put up. That path has been filled in and that fencing will become permanent in the next week or so. But some people say that isn't enough and it's taken too long. That includes Robert Horning, whose daughter Megan was badly hurt on Buttermilk Falls years ago. He's been pushing for change ever since. If this was a workplace, you wouldn't be allowed anywhere near this place. They would cordon this off. Megan's younger sister, Danielle, now avoids the area. 
I don't even know. It's a beautiful area and I don't want to see it cut off. <laughs> oh my God. But like, that's what they're going to have to do. Like, look at this kid right now. But back at Albion Falls, people say signs and barriers are not a solution. It's gorgeous down there, right? They have to do something to enable people to access the waterfall. Likely not what officials are hoping to hear. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Hamilton. When six right whales were found dead in the Gulf of St. Lawrence in just one month, it was an alarming sign for an endangered species. Tonight, preliminary results are in on the cause. Postmortems show that two whales showed signs of blunt force trauma. A third suffered from what's known as chronic entanglement, being caught up in fishing gear. Additional analysis is expected in the coming weeks. It's believed there are only about 500 North Atlantic right whales in existence. It's a busy week for Justin Trudeau. He's on his way to meet with other world leaders at a G20 summit in Germany. But tonight, the Prime Minister is in Dublin. For both countries, Canada and Ireland, trade is top of mind, considering the economic uncertainty tied to their neighbours. Katie Simpson is covering the trip for us. The Prime Minister's trip to Dublin comes at a time of political change in Ireland. But before holding a series of high-level meetings, Justin Trudeau and his family arrive to see a familiar face. Trudeau, his wife Sophie Gregoire Trudeau, and their youngest son Hadrian were met on the tarmac by Kevin Vickers, the former sergeant-at-arms recognized for his heroic actions during the Parliament Hill shooting, who is now Canada's ambassador to Ireland. Trudeau's official events begin tomorrow, where he'll meet with Ireland's new Prime Minister, Leo Radkar. The son of an Indian immigrant, Radkar is the country's first openly gay Prime Minister and has been on the job for about a month. Trade will be the key point of discussion, as both countries are facing significant challenges on this front. Ireland is trying to find its footing as Brexit talks continues, while Canada is about to renegotiate NAFTA amid its uncertain relationship with the Trump administration. So both leaders are in the market to find new trading opportunities. Trudeau will be looking for Ireland's help also at getting the Canada-European free trade deal to the next phase. He'd hoped it would be in place by July 1st, but European concerns about cheese quotas and drug rules have slowed the implementation process. This, of course, is just the first stop for the Prime Minister. Later in the week, he'll head to Scotland for a private audience with the Queen before travelling to Germany for the G20. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Dublin. When the PM returns home to Ottawa, things are going to look a little different at his office. The sign outside the building, known for decades as the Langevin Block, was removed today. Trudeau announced the building would be renamed the Office of the Prime Minister and Privy Council on National Aboriginal Day last month. There had been calls from many Indigenous peoples to change the name because Hector Langevin was one of the architects of the residential school system. Everyone needs a holiday once in a while, right? But New Jersey Governor Chris Christie is now taking a lot of heat for spending a weekend at the beach. That may sound like an odd reason to heap mockery and scorn upon a politician, but as Chris O'Neill Yates explains, there's a very good reason people are fuming. The 4th of July holiday in America. Time for families to relax and soak up some sun. But Governor Chris Christie's tranquility was short-lived. Pictures of him lounging on a beach he himself closed as part of a government shutdown have sparked a furious response. I'm, I'm pissed off. It's a holiday weekend. What about all the kids that had birthday parties and paid to rent to have a barbecue here? It's not fair. No one can enjoy their holiday right now. And here we are at an impasse. That impasse over the New Jersey state budget led the governor to shut state beaches and other tourist attractions to the public. Yesterday, Christie hopped a government helicopter to a news conference where he quickly lost patience with all those beach questions. Next. Next. Um, excuse me. Next. Next. I'm done. We're talking about the closure of government, and you're talking about your TMZ stuff. Christie also denied catching any rays, despite the photo evidence. I didn't get any sun today. Christie, nearing the end of his term, is no stranger to controversy. A few years back, several of his staffers were accused of colluding to create dangerous traffic jams to score political points. He was recently in the news as head of Donald Trump's transition team, but was replaced after the election. Today, cable news pounced on the beach pictures. 
Chris Christie has always enjoyed the perks of the office, and that includes helicopter rides on a state-owned helicopter to his gubernatorial state uh, paid for little beach house uh, on the water. The only one I can think of who had a lower uh, approval rating than Chris Christie is Rod Blagojevich, who is uh, the governor of Illinois, who is currently incarcerated. And as for Christie's claim that he didn't get any sun, his aide tried to clarify, saying he didn't get any sun because he was wearing a hat. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Washington. Coming up, movie scores can be unforgettable. <laughs> now, symphony orchestras use them to draw big crowds. I've never seen an orchestra, so this is my first time seeing like a live symphony orchestra. Yeah. Plus, the strange appeal of a great big duck that comes with a whopping bill. 18 people are dead and 30 injured after a fiery crash in southern Germany this morning. They were on a tour bus headed to Italy when it collided with a truck. Firefighters were initially held back by the intensity of the flames. Many on board were senior citizens. At least 10 people were injured when a taxi slammed into them at Boston's Logan International Airport. Police believe the driver accidentally jumped the curb and drove into a group of other cabbies waiting for passengers. CN Rail now says 76,000 liters of crude oil was spilled when these tankers derailed on Friday. The train was headed from Canada down to Louisiana. There were no injuries, but it's not yet clear what caused the accident. More than eight months after it began, the battle to liberate Iraq's second largest city from ISIS is winding down. Once all powerful in Mosul, the militant group has now lost all but a tiny fraction of the city. The Iraqi army is already planning victory celebrations, but as Derek Stoffel reports, there's still some fighting to finish up first. Iraqi security forces are aiming for a swift final victory. They've surrounded the last remaining ISIS fighters holed up in a shrinking section of the old city, a handful of streets now near the Tigris River. For the militants, it's a futile last stand. The operation is now mainly a ground battle. Although there were some airstrikes carried out by the U.S.-led coalition today, Assaults from the air have become dangerous as Iraqi soldiers and thousands of civilians are now in very close quarters. ISIS fighters are using families as human shields, this officer says. They carry children in their arms. The military operation to retake Mosul from ISIS began last October. Since then, tens of thousands of Iraqi soldiers and police officers, as well as Iranian-backed militias and Kurdish forces, have taken part. Now, with ISIS on the verge of defeat in the city where its leader proclaimed its caliphate three years ago, some of those soldiers have begun to celebrate. It may be a bit premature, however, as it could take a little time still to eliminate the last ISIS fighters from the city. Summer temperatures of nearly 50 degrees have slowed the pace of the battle, leaving soldiers exhausted. But they will have to press on. ISIS still controls at least two important towns, Tel Afar west of Mosul and Hawija to the southeast. In Syria, American-backed Kurdish and Arab soldiers continue to take on ISIS in Raqqa, their de facto capital. The self-proclaimed Islamic State is close to defeat in Iraq, but the militants are putting up stiff resistance in Syria, where they remain a dangerous force. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jerusalem. Straight ahead, the sound of movies. Film scores bring a new audience to the Symphony Hall. Fidel Castro, seen here with his brother Raul, has been a focal point of controversy ever since his Barbudos, his bearded guerrillas, overthrew the Batista regime on New Year's Day this year. His executions of former enemies, his gentle handling of communists, his land reform program involving expropriation of large United States interests, all these things have kept him in the headlines. 
He was interviewed in Havana by CBC reporter Michael McClear. Like in Canada, we find support too in the public opinion. Last year, by far the sharpest thorn on the American side was Cuba. Raul Castro, the Minister of Defense, one of the most bitter enemies of the United States, his hatred of all things American surpassed only by that of his brother Fidel. Do you think that Canada should continue to trade with Cuba despite the United States embargo on trade with that country? I don't think we should let uh, the United States decision uh, not to trade with Cuba to influence us. I think we have to stick to the United States policy. I personally am against any trade with Cuba. Pierre Trudeau was the first leader of a Western industrial nation to step on Cuban soil to be greeted with a warm and friendly double handshake by Fidel Castro since Castro came out of the mountains leading a revolution that started turning Cuba into a communist state in 1959. At a quick news conference, Trudeau was asked if he was concerned about the people back home who were shocked by his presence in a communist state. Well, the category of people which would be shocked by that have long since been shocked by my visit to China and uh, to the Soviet Union, so uh, I guess I can't worry about that. The Prime Minister arrived, Fidel Castro was there to greet him with a tirade about the United States. El bloqueo contra Cuba. Castro said the blockade is a calumny. He said it's genocide. The Prime Minister made no direct response to him. In his brief remarks, he talked of a new awareness in Cuba. An expression of confidence in the increasing openness of Cuba to the wider world. Most of these people couldn't tell you the name of the Canadian Prime Minister, but they know about Canada. Canada figures high up in their homes. A strange yellow giant is invading Ontario's shores, a floating freeloader whose ticket to Toronto was paid by the province and it's been drawing a crowd. So earlier today we thought, well, we got to go down there and see what the big deal is. Have you seen a duck by any chance? Yeah, <laughs> it's, right it's hard to miss, right? Yeah. <laughs> Many flocked to Toronto's harbour front for a glimpse of the rare bird. Did you come down to see the duck? Yes. Yeah. It's we giant! <laughs> they didn't all agree on this species. What do you make of it? It's different. Thought it should have been a loony. It, do you think it's very Canadian? No, I think it should be a Canadian goose. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. That's a good idea. But some people dove right into the theme. This is Annabelle. She is really working out. Yep. It's her four month birthday today, she so. Came down and oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what do, you, what do you and Annabelle make of the duck? Oh, we love it, don't we? I took the rubber ducky from her bathtub and then I took some ribbon and poked some holes and tied it around her head. Mama Duck here, as she's officially known, weighs in at 30,000 pounds, six stories tall. And after spending some time here in Toronto, she will sail away to five more locations in Ontario. The price tag, by the way, for the entire six city tour, $71,000 US. Of that, the Toronto stop is the most expensive, coming in at 21000 for the four-day stint. Festival organizers received a $121,000 grant from Ontario taxpayers that helped cover the cost. Are you okay that you've paid for it? Like tax dollars paid for it? Uh, I wasn't aware that our tax dollars Yeah, your tax dollars paid for it. Despite the big bill, even non-believers seem to be sold on Mama Duck. Ridiculous, <laughs> but awesome. Why? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. I don't know much about it, yeah. um, but I think it's very cool for kids, and yeah. it seems like it's bringing in a lot of attraction. Do you like the duck? You don't? Yes, he does. He's yes. been talking about the duck the whole time. Where is it? Oh. It's worth coming and seeing it. I was a little really? skeptical at first to avoid the big duck, but yeah, it's quite fun, especially for the kids. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a once in a lifetime type thing, you know? You won't ever see something like that again. Probably not. <laughs> okay, now to a treat for your ears this time. Movie soundtracks are enjoying a new afterlife through live performances by symphony orchestras. Eli Glasner shows us why those cinematic sounds are catching on. It's a big night at the symphony in Toronto. Three nights of sold out performances 
But it's not Beethoven or Brahms that has the audience humming. Come on, everyone has this tune in your brain. Da, 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 da. If you have that in your brain, you know how great it is. That is the music of Harry Potter. And this live performance of the symphonic score is bringing in new fans. I've never seen an orchestra, so this is my first time seeing like a live symphony orchestra. Justin Freer is the conductor and president of a new series of touring movie concerts. Playing the entire score live makes for a musical marathon. He consumes 3,000 calories before every performance. It's quite a feat for an orchestra to have to be on top of every beat for nearly a three hour period over the course of the evening in a way that the orchestras didn't really necessarily have to deal with when they were recording. And Harry Potter is just part of a growing wave of live movie music. Thousands packed the Hollywood Bowl for La La Land in concert. Film composer Hans Zimmer is on tour, wowing audiences with the music of Inception and Gladiator. In Montreal, Vancouver, and Calgary, symphonies are putting more movie music on the program. Musicians such as Larry Larson say it's about time. Most of these soundtracks are, are written by composers who had a classical influence and were, you know, they're, they're making their own Wagner opera, basically, to, uh, or Strauss tone poem to these movies. It is almost the classical music of our time. So we decided to see just how well people know their movies. Ready? <laughs> Movie music is evidently the fabric of our lives now. Canadian composer Michael Dana wrote the music for films such as Moneyball and Capote. In the fall, the TSO will open their season by performing his score to Life of Pi. And he says these performances are keeping orchestras relevant. I think it's fantastic because it's something that is removed of kind of the snobbery of the archaic feeling of it. In fact, orchestral players, people that play in orchestras, a lot of them have told me the reason they got into picking up a violin is because, you know, of Star Wars or, or some score that really moved them. And whether it's Star Wars or Harry Potter, cinematic symphonies are inspiring a new generation of music fans. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Oh, it's cool. I'd do that. Coming up, Mike Myers weighs in on polite Canadians. Could it be we're just passive aggressive? There is a little bit of that. There's a, there's a little, we are, we, we will put up a wall of pleasant to, to people, to Americans mostly. <laughs> he sits down with Wendy Mesley to get at the heart of this country. But first, is Canada growing apart from its most important ally? We examine the evidence. First, we'll look at the business numbers. Canadian markets closed, obviously, for the holiday. In New York, though, the Dow gained 129 points. The price of oil rose a dollar a barrel. The National with Milton Nash. Good evening and welcome to rainy Vancouver and Expo 86. The province they call Supernatural is ready. They've been drilling, painting, cleaning, and checking all week. I think everyone's uh, relatively calm. There's everything here from the world's biggest flagpole to the world's biggest hockey stick and the world's biggest hockey puck. You never know what you'll see next, and you never know who you're going to meet next. There's the mascot of the fair, Expo Ernie. Wake up, bless my little robotic heart. It's Nolan Nash and the crew from the National. How do you do? Glad to have you here. Expo is a fair about transportation, so this state-of-the-art monorail was a natural. For the first two months, it kept breaking down, but now it's carrying capacity crowds. The sun shone for the first time in weeks in Vancouver today, and with the sun, Expo 86 came alive. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people got to see the fair for the first time. Being Saturday, it was a big day for the children. And for children, what counts at a fair is the fun. There was no shortage of that. Just great. It's bringing the whole country together, too. $5,000 is spent every night by Expo for a computerized laser and fireworks show. It's called International Nights of Fire. 
We've never seen fireworks like that before. Oh, that was awesome. At 86th Street, they party with the Powder Blues Band, and they obey the rules to eat, drink, and go crazy. When they first opened, these nightclubs had so many customers, things sometimes got out of hand. So extra doormen were hired, proper dress is now required. The people who don't like dress codes still have a place to go, though. At the Irish pub, there doesn't seem to be any code at all. Expo has done itself proud. That's yeah, great. They did well. I enjoyed myself like no other time. It's the best thing that ever happened to British Columbia and to me. I love it. I've had a great time here. When we said, when we said in the House of Commons, that that was the most ridiculous policy ever, then, Mr. then, if you will just wait, the truth will be given to you. To unfurl a flag that is truly distinctive and truly national in character, as Canadian as a maple leaf on your badge, when the cavalcade rolled up to a stage where Trudeau was to make remarks in support of the local candidates, he was confronted by sign-carrying hecklers again. This time, protesting high unemployment. Trudeau's response, as it has been throughout this campaign, was to fight back. Yeah, we saw you last night with your painted and hired signs and your hired friends. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight of you holding signs like little boys. Come on, go and look for some jobs. No, you're lost without your notes. This lady just wouldn't give up and kept up a barrage of one-liners throughout the speech. Are you running as a rhinoceros or as a liberal? Eh? No raw, raw speeches! The truth! Mulroney was frequently interrupted by a large and unusually provocative group of hecklers, most of them striking workers at the Gainers meatpacking plant in Edmonton. Mulroney appealed for calm, didn't get it, and I didn't like it. You can yell and you can scream all you want. I fought bigger and better people than you, and I'll do it again. As the Prime Minister continued toward his car, he came face to face with one of the demonstrators. Suddenly, Chrétien took the man by the back of the neck. His other hand was over the protester's mouth. He pushed him aside. Seconds later, another protester approached the Prime Minister. Chrétien knocked over the bullhorn that was in his hand. But he was right in front of me, shouting and trying to block my way, so I took him out. Your lake is said to be saltier than the ocean. The only place saltier is the Dead Sea itself and the armpits of Orville Redenbach. This is Manitou Beach, Saskatchewan. An all-new Still Standing, Tuesday at 8 on CBC. Summer is golden on CBC Sports. Come on, y'all, it's time to rise up. Geography has made us neighbors. History has made us friends. Economics has made us partners. And necessity has made us allies. When President Kennedy spoke those words about our two countries, Canada was not yet 100 years old. Now we've turned 150, and a lot happened in between. Living next to you is in some ways like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly or even tempered is the beast, if you can call it that, one is affected by every twitch and grunt. Sharing the world's longest border hasn't always been easy, but Canada and the U.S. have gotten along for the most part, because of what we have in common and also because of the roles we've taken on. We're more like siblings, really. Free trade brought us closer together, nearly erasing the border when it came to moving goods, but recently things have changed. Canada what they've done to our dairy farm workers is a disgrace. The U.S. has a $400 million uh, dairy surplus with Canada. It's not Canada that is the challenge here. And our sibling dynamic is becoming, well, more contentious. I am a feminist and proud to call myself one. And when you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. Whatever you want. Grab them by the... And while we seem to share a somewhat similar worldview, are we now looking in different directions? Joining me now to talk about all that from Ottawa, Sachi Curl. She's executive director of the Angus Reid Institute. Here in Toronto, Michael Adams, president of the Enveronics Institute. And Jeet Hare is senior editor of the New Republic. All right, I'm going to start with you, Sachi, since you're uh, over there in Ottawa in my hometown. Do you think that the perception of Canada has changed in any way and in an important way since Donald Trump became president? 
Well, I think what's important to remember is the perception hasn't uh, deteriorated in the eyes of Americans. You know, there's a couple of lenses to look at this through. There is the Trump Canada lens, which we just saw a little bit about, but there's also Americans and Canadians. And Americans still think that despite the, the supply management stuff and despite NAFTA, that we're pretty good eggs. They put us at the top of their list in terms of dependable allies, friends, people they want to trade with over and above the British, the Australians, the French, the Germans, the Japanese, and well over and above the Mexicans. And I do think that that is an important thing for Canadians to remember uh, as we go into this summer of, of uh, uncertainty around NAFTA and Canadians saying, well, we should take a hard line on these mm -hmm. issues. I think it just, it's good to have that gut check. Don't you think, though, Jeet Her Her that because of, maybe because of our prime minister, in contrast to Donald Trump, that the world has a different picture of us? And I don't know if it's just the contrast, if it's just Justin Trudeau, if it's just Don Donald Trump. I don't know how you would characterize that. But there's a different view of Canada than there was before? Sure, yeah. Canada's yeah. A, a contrast gainer. Uh, if you look at international polls, it's not so much Canada has improved. It's <laughs> that uh, Americans' reputation has really gone hugely downhill. Right. Uh, just uh, recently, uh, Angela Merkel's party has, uh, in their official statement, no longer listed the United States as a friend. Uh, which is a huge change for, you know, center-right party. Um, but I, I think we can overemphasize this. I think we have to make a difference between uh, nations and regimes. And regimes come and go. I mean, just sure. a few years ago, one could say, you know, Obama was in Washington and Harper was in uh, uh, Ottawa, so Canada's more conservative. Right. So it, it, it's, it's about brand, uh, Michael Adams, mm -hmm. but it's also about, um, it, it's about where we're at in a particular mm -hmm. place in time. So how, how would you evaluate sort of where Canada is and where we see ourselves, maybe? Well, I, I think we do think a lot about ourselves and <laughs> asking the question about, you know, what the world thinks of us. The world doesn't think about Canada right. very much. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I was thinking, you know, about Al Capone, the great mobster from Chicago. He said, I don't even know what street Canada's on. I mean, what Americans know about us is that, you know, we, we don't have guns. We've got health insurance. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're nice sometimes. Of course, they haven't maybe met many of us. But You don't think that has changed, though, and that this is a government that's trying to push its way onto the international you stage know, in a different way? They're, yeah. they're, Americans are benignly ignorant of Canada, really. They, you know, they know we're cold in the winter and so on, but essentially the broad public doesn't really know very much and doesn't care very much about us. And it's probably the same for the rest of the world. There is, suggest, kind of a, there is kind of yeah. a vague feeling that Canada's okay and that you know, if they know Trudeau, he's kind of a cool guy. But it's, it's actually, if you, if you had to think about it, it's the Canadians who spent all their time thinking about the United yes, States. Sure. You ask yeah, Americans sure. who our prime minister is, they, we'd be lucky, I don't know, to get 10% who do, whereas we all know who the president of the United States is. And of course, America is a place we admire, a place that entertains us, and a place that terrifies us. And it's been that way for a couple of hundred years. Shachi wants back in there. Go ahead. I would just say that among those who do know something and do have an opinion, let's let's not forget that 35 of 50 states in the United States look to Canada as a main economic driver. You talked about the erasure of that border in terms of movement of goods, and that is has a huge economic impact on Americans. And they may not spend a lot of time thinking about us. They, look, they've got other issues. They've got some big, big issues to be dealing with, both domestically and on the international stage. But what they do know, what their perceptions are. Yes, there's the niceness, but that is genuine. And there is also a recognition that things like NAFTA uh, have actually benefited both countries, separate from what the politicians would say, separate from what Donald Trump says, and separate from how they perceive Mexico in all of this relationship. They do see Canada as, as, as one that is a mutually, a mutually beneficial mm -hmm. partner. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that that's true? I mean, you guys are all really downplaying now what our country, and I'm sort of surprised because I was under the impression that we were sort of maybe not getting out from under the shadow of the United States, but certainly pushing in that direction. I talked about the, to the PM about it just on Canada Day, yeah. you know, about how we're still modest, but we're trying to take up a little more yeah, space. Yeah, I, I think we can be overemphasizing the sort of continuity. There's a, there is a real change with Trump. I, I think going back from Pearl Harbor until 
um, uh, last November, there was a sort of um, America and Canada shared a fundamental foreign policy vision yeah. of mm -hmm. trying to create yeah. a liberal global order. And uh, that's, that's gone. Like Trump doesn't believe that. Whereas Trudeau very much does. And in, in fact, everybody in Canada does. All the, all the parties are agreed on that. Uh, and the Europeans are agreed on that. So, so I think that division, the fact that Canada is now one of the main players upholding the liberal order, that's a huge change. Shachia, I see your face go. <laughs> What I would say is this, absolutely, from a legal and a convention standpoint, and yes, all parties are, are in agreement around some of those basic tenets of inclusivity, but I think that we can't kid ourselves or the world stage in terms of Canadian attitudes and the limits of some of this. Yeah. We are not a country with endless realms of tolerance when it comes to integration. There are still significant pockets of opposition to uh, issues around LGBTQ uh, rights and and other rights and we're not necessarily as onside with things like the Paris Agreement and and carbon taxes mm -hmm. as we would like to think we are. Yeah. So yes, we are certainly more compared to the US, but that doesn't mean that we're all the way over in some sort of progressive nirvana. That's not the case and I think there are risks to pushing too far too fast around that. Right, but M Michael, the, the American exceptionalism that everyone talked about mm -hmm. that seems to have been replaced by a sort of isolationism uh, is, is right. now in contrast to Canada, even though we see states doing different things and pushing in different ways to sort of be part of climate change and fight climate change. So well, they always yeah. have been exceptional yeah. and they are an experiment. We, they're the revolutionary people. We're the counter-revolutionary people. They asked us to join them. They came to Quebec and, <laughs> and uh, you know, in 1775 and Quebec says, no, yeah. uh, we don't want your uh, religious freedom. We like Roman Catholicism. So we've been, you know, we've been constantly different, and I see it even in the research over the last 20, 30 years. I mean, we are, we're not defining ourselves in the, you know, uh, being a colony of Britain or France or, no. or, not be, or a colony of the United States. Actually, what's evolved over the last 50 years of the progressive era is that Canada is coming to understand itself in its own terms. As a country where French and English, Catholic and Protestant, right. you know, the regions get along. We give ourselves a federal system. Uh, the Canadian who crosses the road to get to the middle. You know, the compromise. Uh, you step on a Canadian's foot and they apologize. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sorry my foot was in your way. <laughs> but we, we've developed an awareness of our own national character. And it's, right. and it's sui generis. It's, it's Canadian exceptionalism as well. Yes, we could take it too far, but certainly we've had a progressive era where we've embraced multiculturalism, diversity, getting along with other people and so on, a place where people get right. along and don't kill each other. So it's a very strong sense of nationalism that we feel ourselves and we don't need to compare ourselves to all the rest well, of the world. That, yeah. uh, we can look at our own, at ourselves, engage with the rest of the world, leverage our power. We're only 35 yeah. million people. Yeah. I think we've got a sense of our own self what our strengths are and the many things that we have to do to become even better. Like, of course, do something with regard to truth and reconciliation with Aboriginal people. So here we are, you know, celebrating 150 years, but we now we real, now we have to apologize. Sorry, we we missed out the decimal point wrong, and it's actually 15,000 years. So it's very Canadian yeah. to be celebrating the way we are, but at the same time, kind of apologizing in a sense that we we still have some ways to go, as Satya said. I only have a couple of minutes left, but Jeet, is that what it is then? It's it's a comfort with our own identity, perhaps in the face of seeing things change dramatically in the United States or elsewhere in the world. Yeah, but also, I mean, it's such a dramatic change in the United States. I mean, I think the Trudeau government is basically treating America as a failed state where you have to ignore the fictional government and deal with local warlords in, in California or New York Governors State. Governors in this case, yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. So, so, I mean, that's a, that's a dramatic change. Yeah, Sachi, last word to you on, on, on that part, on the identity and whether we are starting to feel just more secure, maybe? I don't know if that's the word. We are a country where our connection is really predicated on security and stability and the idea of a better life. And so the caveat around that is, yes, yay Canada, yay Canadianness around all of that. But when uh, and if we get to a point where our young people feel like they can't access that Canadian dream, mm. their sense of pride and attachment isn't based in something deeply nationalistic. It's based in that good standard of living. And we've got to ensure that in, in order to maintain that good feeling, we've got to maintain maintain that, that good life, too. Okay, Sachi Curl, Michael Adams, Jeet Hare, thank you all, appreciate yeah, thank it. You. Thank you. Now, come right back for a cross-border Canadian, Mike Myers. <laughs> He's got funny things to say about us and them.
just an hour after the New York attack, planes started arriving in Gander. While local officials figured out what to do, passengers waited on board in 30 degree heat. It was dusk before the first passengers were processed and given a place to sleep. They knew little of the day's events. Uh, the crew didn't really tell us much. Well, of course, we didn't really know what was going on. They quickly found out. There's the plane. You can't miss that. Incredible. All night, plane by plane, the passengers were allowed to disembark. But there was little anger with their own plight. I think we were just happy to be on the ground at that point, given what we had heard. Every school, church halls and basements made into makeshift shelters. 750 at this Gander school, many not knowing even where they were. Now a lot of European people know Uganda, never heard before, but now they know. They know of it now. Absolutely. Yeah. Daybreak brought the reality of the task for Gander and all the surrounding communities that chipped in to help. Where's this load of stuff going? Oh, Glenwood, school in Glenwood. At the Salvation Army, a desperate call for help was answered by local residents. The biggest need for food, towels and bedding. Getting lots of volunteers, lots of donations, blankets, towels, food, and uh, there's still a lot more to do, so we're pushing on. All of what's happening is being appreciated by the unexpected tourists. We're very grateful and I would hope that Americans would treat Canadians with the same kindness. The people in this town should be blessed forever. This morning, it's breakfast for 300. Hopefully we'll get them all fed within a reasonable time. How long have you been here helping us? Oh, uh, we came here yesterday morning and we worked till uh, 9, 10 o'clock last night and we came back again 7 o'clock this morning. Most of the food donated, cooked in a school home economics classroom. None of this extraordinary hospitality lost on the visitors. But everybody, I mean, everybody in the whole town has pulled together. And then we're chuffed to bits, we're really all proud. Yeah, yeah absolutely great. You are, we're lovely people. I just thought we could do the same if it, uh, if it ever happened in our country. Joe Dunn is giving back, serving breakfast to the town that fed and housed him for five days when his plane was forced to land in Gander on September 11th. Today he was joined by a dozen other U.S. passengers who've returned on this day. I can only equate it to like a love from a grandmother. That's really what it felt like. The matrons in town, it was really, it was their, their caring was just, uh, it was unbelievable. It was a great example of the human spirit. That caring has turned into friendship. Dunn continues to stay in touch and reunite with the woman who gave him shelter. Stella Brazil welcomed other passengers into her home on 9-11. She's just one of hundreds of local people that did the same. I think it's just our nature to be that way and nobody looked at it as being any type of a big sacrifice. The U.S. ambassador came to Newfoundland to say thank you and remember this day in a way most other Americans aren't. On the one hand, it's a very sad, tragic event that we're here to commemorate. But on the other hand, you see the spirit of these people and the spirit of the kids, um, and it makes you feel good. I believe that I've done one of the most successful deals in the history of Dragon's Den. There was two guys with a box of chocolates and no sales. Today they're doing tens of millions of dollars in sales. Every Canadian and every person has the right to have a dream. Johnny's back. Well, that's what happens. There's, there's nobody more Canadian than a Canadian who no longer lives in Canada. Comedian Mike Myers has had a fantastic run. His movies have made billions of dollars. His characters instantly recognizable around the world. And now he's a member of the Order of Canada, fittingly appointed on the country's 150th birthday. Wendy sat down with Myers last fall, just as his new book came out, A Love Letter to His Homeland. The Canada Day long weekend seemed like the perfect time to share that conversation again. <laughs> Mike Myers. Hello, je suis Mike Myers. You know him. Excuse me? I know him. Yes! Wow. Actually, the world knows him. Yeah, baby! <laughs> yeah. But we get to call him ours. Oh! Cool! For years, Canada has watched as Myers conquered the world of comedy. Heat! Move! First, here at home as a child actor. Shove off, fat boy. 
before hitting it big on Saturday Night Live. Now I am as happy as a little girl. <laughs> and being the creative force behind blockbuster movies like Austin Powers <laughs> and Wayne's World. He's leaving, he winds up! Throughout it all, he's remained proudly Canadian. Game on! Game on! Now he's turning the spotlight on his home country. Yes, yes. Now, Brian, are you ashamed to be Canadian? Looking to see what makes Canada tick and using his own family experiences as a way of examining why being Canadian means so much to him. Our hunky new Prime Minister Trudeau, hello. <laughs> Degrassi Jr. High. <laughs> Sir Justin Bieber. <laughs> He's written all about it in his debut book called Canada. I met up with Mike Myers earlier in Toronto. Mike, so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so you moved away 33 years ago. Yes. We kind of thought you'd forgotten about us. No, 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 quite the opposite. Yeah, your book is like, it's all full of, like, you're almost like a Canadian. I'm almost like a Canadian. Canadian, a hoarder. <laughs> Me? Well, that's what happens. There's, there's nobody more Canadian than a Canadian who no longer lives in Canada. And so, um, you know, I say in the book, and a lot of my friends in America accuse me of enjoying being Canadian. And I go, I do enjoy being Canadian. What's not to enjoy? It's not a perfect place. You know, as my dad would say, in a perfect world, you don't need ut utopia. But, um, <laughs> but I challenge in the history of nation states to find any other country that's tried to get it right as much as Canada has. You know what I mean? And just even in the act of trying to get it right is the right thing to do. We were very politically correct at times. And I always think, wasn't politically correct just being considerate and nice for the most part? You know what I mean? One can get trapped in it, but we're very polite people. When does that get bad? Uh, you know, <laughs> believe me, all you have to do is go to a country where people aren't polite. And you kind of love the Canadian standoff of two Canadians in a doorway, after you, oh, nobody, after you, after you, and you're just sitting there. In New York, you'd be like, go, oh! right? But in Canada, it's fantastic. You know, that's who we are. But are we too polite? Are we, do we lack confidence? I mean, you've decided to live there, you've succeeded there. I do love America. It's a great place to make things, and I make things, you know what I mean? Um, I miss Canada. You can take the boy out of Canada, but you can't take the Canada out of the boy. You know, it's, uh, I'm British by heritage, yeah, your dad was staunchly British. Yeah. He didn't like your accent. No, we, we had a Liverpool accent talk like that, like, great, love it. And then I would say, hey, dad, pass the sauce. He'd go, sauce. Because hear yeah, that, missus. What a terrible accent our children have. I go, you're the limey freak, dude. You're in my country. <laughs> we don't think we have an accent. The Canadian, there is no Canadian. Yes, accent. there is a belief that in the integer of the English language that we are at zero linguistically or yeah. accent-wise. It's not true. We have a very thick Canadian. We, the accent is very, very pronounced, more than I think Canadians think that it is. Well, the one we always hear is oot. Say oot again. Oot. We don't say oot. Out. But there's a, I think, is it called a diphthong? I'm looking like as if there's a linguistic <laughs> Expert. linguist here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can somebody find the linguist, please? Thank you. It's out, out. And we don't really say A all the time. Yes, we do. <laughs> we do. We really do. And there's another thing, too, of Canadian women uh, as, a, as a tendency, but not as a rule, the sort of, there's a, oh, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. And in America, you know, an American was telling my sister-in-law in America a story, and she was being polite, saying, so he's like, yeah, I was on the subway today. And she went, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And the American was like, I'll get to the end of the story. You don't have to <laughs> shut me down. Because it sounded like, oh, yeah, will you stop talking? <laughs> well, exactly. But instead, Maybe we're saying... I'm interested. But I'm, I'm listening I don't to you. Know. Maybe, maybe it's uh, passive aggressive. Maybe we're not really that polite. We're just not mm. telling you what we really think. There is a little bit of that. There's a, there's a little, we are, we, we will put up a wall of pleasant <laughs> to, to people, to Americans mostly. <laughs> yeah. Well, we feel very superior right now watching what's happening in the elections in the States. No, I bet Canadians are doing a jig right now. <laughs> Look at those Yankee idiots. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm kidding. But for the most part. We're just not a terribly angry people. Hockey, of course, would make you think that, that what I just said is a complete lie. But, you know, the crowds at Maple Leaf Garden, or now Air Canada Centre, like if the other team does a nice passing play, you will get a round of applause. I wore a Toronto Maple Leafs shirt to a New York Rangers game, 
and I evidently found out stuff about my mother. I had no idea. <laughs> evidently, my mother's a prostitute. There we have it. It's funny what you learn at a hockey game, huh? But do Canadians need to be more competitive? You, you say it's like American. Here's what I say. This is just my opinion. This whole book is just my opinion. I, I'm happy to hear Canadians' opinions. You know what I'm saying? And I am actually. I am fascinated by what was because it's not a famous experience being Canadian. We don't have a. If you're English, you can say it's, it's a little bit like Harry Potter. It's a little bit like, or if you're American, it's like a little bit like anything you've seen on Disney. And in Canada, it's there's no real film for us to point to about a Canadian childhood. It often feels like a dream, you know what I mean? Beachcombers? No. You can't point that to anybody because nobody outside of Canada would have seen the beachcombers, which is no much... No one's seen anything? There's nothing... No Anna Green else? Gables. And I can hardly say, okay, so growing up in Scarborough, so you remember when she got her pigtails in the inkwell? <laughs> well, it's not like that. But the point is, you know what I mean? There really isn't. We're not a culture for export. That's okay. But everything else balances it out. I'll often say, we may not have put a man on the moon, but we've been awfully nice to the man on Earth. And then I'll say, but having said that, why can't we put a man on, on the moon? We actually could do both. That's what's so fantastic. I, I think once you have the mindset that we're a country of alignment and a country of cooperation, then actually we're in a better position to do anything is the truth of it. You know what I mean? And that's my feeling about Canada. And I think civility will be our greatest legacy. When you went to SNL, you formed a bit of a bond with Lord Michaels, another Canadian. He yes. He took you under his wing. He really did. And gave you, he said, as a Canadian, there would be two things that would be different. Well, he said, you'll do well, which is very, very nice, especially I'm scared out of my mind. He said, because you're Canadian and you'll study. And you'll have the necessary built-in, baked-in humility of being a Canadian that, oh, I better learn how this works, right? And I'll pay attention to the rules, you know. We, we love rules in Canada. And I'm just saying, go to a country that has no rules and see how quickly you go, boy, I really miss rules. It's, it's okay, rules. You know, of course, everything in its correct measure. But he said, you're not going to enjoy things being unfair. Mm. He has said, you, your heart will be broken that many of the talented people that you meet, that character and talent don't go hand in hand in equal measure. Is that true? 100% true. But it doesn't matter. Mm. It, it, it doesn't matter. For Americans, they'll say, did you meet so-and-so? And they'll say, what's he like? Canadian will say, was he nice? They need to be nice in Canada. And most cultures don't need you to be nice. Wayne yes. was created here. Yes. He's, he's a secret Canadian? No, he's very much, I mean, I'm Because he's not, from Aurora, not Aurora, Ontario. I know, but here I am on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Every week I think I'm getting fired. I did a, a show here on Canadian TV, and I did Wayne on it. Hi, I'm Wayne Campbell, and this is my Power Minute. All right. And I thought, oh, I wonder if it should be Canadian. I turned to somebody, what's like, and I described Scarborough, and somebody says, Aurora, Illinois. It was Christine Zander, one of the writers on Saturday Night Live. I said, oh, there's Aurora, Ontario. I handed it in that night. <laughs> That's how things work on Saturday Night Live. It's an under-rehearsed Broadway opening once a week, is what Gilda Radner called it. And, um, she also said it's a monster, an insatiable monster that eats your material insatiably. The amount of decisions that you think are based on a lot of time of thought and a little bit, no, you have to just write or you're not on the show. So the decision to have him be from Scarborough, but have him be from the suburbs, I made no concession to a Chicago accent. It's not like he talks like, oh my God, my dad gave me a dollar. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, it's absolutely not true. He has a Scarborough accent, you know what I mean? So, and it's just little letters to home within the whole piece. Well, in lots of what you do, there's hints of Canadiana. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you can't sneak help it, it. In. I do. Little, uh, little packages home. It is interesting how very little the world knows about us. It's, it's shocking. And that's fine. But that's where we're at. You know? So how much on Saturday Night Live, how much do they talk about us? About Canada? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's funny. Um, a friend of mine came up to see, I was at Second City in Toronto, a friend of mine came to see the show, American, and there was an anti-American song in the, in the show, which I actually didn't want to do, because I, I don't think it's interesting to be anti-American. I think it's interesting to just be Canadian, but it was a funny song and whatever, and the friend said, wow, I had no idea that you guys thought that much about us, the American said about Canadians. And I said, well, what do you think of us? And he said, we don't. And I was like, wow, game set and match, man. Okay, when we come back, indigenous athletes gather in Alberta, but these games aren't just about winning.
I'm Mike Finnerty. Tomorrow on the summer edition of The Current, Hidden Figures tells the story of where the civil rights movement collided with NASA and the space race in the 1960s in the U.S. That's on the summer edition of The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1. The amazing Alouette has outperformed anything that's been shot into space since the Russians started it with Sputnik 1. The mere fact that it's still faithfully sending back messages from the top side of the ionosphere is enough to make it remarkable. When it was launched in September of 1962, its designers figured that with luck it would operate for a year. As of right now, it's been in orbit for five years and seven months, and three of the six original batteries are still working. It was a picture that Canadian engineers had waited six years to see and for which Canadian taxpayers paid $100 million. A giant space robot with Canada's name on it and the Earth above. The remote manipulator system performing perfectly. Okay, and be advised that we're looking at a great picture. Good evening. It was a spectacular liftoff and a history-making day for Canada. The shuttle Challenger blasted off the pad at Cape Canaveral at dawn. On board, astronaut Mark Garneau, the very first Canadian in space. Uh, this trip into space uh, for me has turned out to be more than uh, ever I could have hoped for. It's a great honor for me to uh, represent Canada in space. Three, two, one, zero, zero. and liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery and the first International Microgravity Laboratory. Good evening. There's a Canadian in the heavens tonight, Roberta Bonder, going around in circles and entirely happy about it. Canada's second astronaut in space. She's orbiting planet Earth about 300 kilometers straight up. She left from this space center this morning, 59 minutes later than scheduled, but after a lifetime of anticipation, those minutes probably won't mean very much in the long run. Incredible view. A crucial spacewalk took place in the skies above us early today, and Canadian astronaut Julie Payette was in charge. Payette coordinated the mission from onboard the space shuttle Discovery. History was made high in the sky today. For the very first time, a Canadian walked in space. Early this morning, astronaut Chris Hadfield began installing Canadarm2, and with it, launched a new era for the International Space Station. With, uh, with great humility and pleasure, I accept command of the International Space Station. Get back soon. The National. The National. Tonight. I waited. But she never did show up to the dance. And she ended up at the Pacific Club. A shocking murder. Her naked body, it was partially covered in snow. This was a life. There's many homicides of our people here in the city. Taken Friday at 9 on CBC. Comedians whose families immigrated to Canada. I was a refugee, and look at me now, huh? In Canadian show business. The government of Nicaragua will never be able to find me. A seriously funny look at what it means to be Canadian. Now I might spill my beer, eh? I go by Drake. What else? Nice. Hosted by Craig Lozon. Now that's Canada! Winnipeg Comedy Festival. Customs and Integration. Wednesday at 9 on CBC. CIBC. Proudly celebrating 150 years together. For the next week, Alberta is hosting athletes from around the world competing in the World Indigenous Games. Oh, wow. The schedule includes archery, lacrosse and other traditional events along with many contemporary sports. Participants come from across Canada, the US, the Americas and as far away as Ethiopia, Russia and New Zealand. Events are being held at several First Nations near Edmonton. Both athletes and organizers say the games are as much about sharing culture as they are about competition. That's the national for this Monday night. For news, any hour, 
you can always go to cbcnews.ca. I'm Rosemary Barton. I'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.